Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Beatles News Briefs. I'm your host Steve Marinucci and here is your Beatles News for December 27, 2018. Democratic Representative Jacob Bachmeyer of the Montana House of Representatives would like to see the 2019 legislature declare the Hippie Hippie Shake as Montana's official rock and roll song. Hippie Hippie Shake was written in 1959 by Chan Ramiro when he was a 17-year-old student at Billings, Montana Senior High School. Romero, who now lives in Southern California, told the Great Falls Tribune he'd be proud to have the song honored by the legislature. For those of you uh, that set your DVRs, uh, A Hard Day's Night will air on Turner Classic Movies Friday night, December 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Turner Classic is airing an evening of music films that night. Before A Hard Day's Night will be Barclays of Broadway with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And following it will be Jailhouse Rock with Elvis Presley, then Tommy with The Who, and the original version from 1954 of A Star is Born with Judy Garland. Check your local times uh, and your local listings for the correct time on A Hard Day's Night. Uh, an Easter egg for those of you who have the Wings Wildlife box set. On CD3, the disc with the bonus audio, after the last track, African Yayas, there's a pause, and then you'll hear a jam of When the Saints Go Marching In. It uh, doesn't last more than a minute or two, but it's there. Uh, it, you won't see it listed on the track listing on the um, album uh, that holds the CDs but it is on the digital download listing, I'm told. Some chart positions from the Billboard issue of December 29th. On the Hot 100, number 47, back on the chart is Wonderful Christmas Time. Number 45, back also back on the chart, is a Happy Christmas. Uh, on the Billboard 200 at 191, back on the chart, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. 180 up from 200 is the Beatles 1 album. 97 up from 117 is Abbey Road. And at number 48 up from 57 is the Beatles White album. On the Artist 100, number 45 up from 94 is Paul McCartney. And number 28 up from 43 are the Beatles. Top album sales. Number 72 back on the chart is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Number 38 up from 49 is Abbey Road. Number 11 up from 14 is the White Album. And number 9 back on the chart is Paul McCartney's Egypt Station. Catalog albums. Number 31 up from 38 is Abbey Road. Number 15 up from 17 is the White Album. Top rock albums. Number 38 back on the chart is Sgt. Pepper. Uh, number 36 up from 40 is number is the Beatles 1. 28 up from 32 is McCartney 2. 27 up from 28 is Power to the People, the Hits by John Lennon. Number 15 up from 16 last week is Abbey Road. Number 9 back on the chart is Egypt Station. And number 7 up from number 8 last week is the Beatles White Album. Rock Digital Song Sales. Number 47, new, Happy Christmas, but not the John and Yoko version, but the Miley Cyrus, Mark Ronson, Sean Lennon version from Saturday Night Live, and you can also find that on YouTube. On the vinyl chart, number 13, up from 20, is Sgt. Pepper. Number 6, staying the same from last week, is the White Album. Number 4, down from number 1, is Abbey Road. Holiday 100, number 16, up from 19, is Wonderful Christmas Time. And number 15, up from 22, is Happy Christmas by John and Yoko. Holiday Airplay, number 21, up from uh, 24, is Happy Christmas. Number 17, up from 20, is Wonderful Christmas Time. Holiday Streaming, number 18, up from 23, is Happy Christmas. And number 20, up from 24, is Wonderful Christmas Time. If you saw my billboard story about the new McCartney box sets with my interviews with Denny Lane and Danny Sywell that was posted uh, December 26th on billboard.com, you saw some great comments about life with Paul and Wings from both of them. Here now is my edited version of my interview with Denny Sywell. I've talked with Denny before and he's great to talk to as you'll see in this interview. 
Um, if you've seen him at Beatle conventions, you know he's always been a great guest. Anyway, here's my edited interview with Jenny Sywell. Take it away. I assume you've seen the 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 remasters, the the boxes. Have you you've seen them? I poured through it last Friday. Did you really? Yeah, they sent me a copy. I've been helping Paul with uh, interviews and what have you, and and I uh, through Universal Music Group and everything here in LA. I took some uh, some of the original uh, uh, acetates from the double album Red Rose Speedway. Took them over, and a lot of that stuff was used. And they used some of my footage, uh, my backstage footage. They're going to be using that as far as. Uh, some ads for the for the thing. Although I hear it was sold out before it was released. The the um, the box set. The big box that combined with the wings from Europe was sold yeah. out. Yes. The uh, the other two the separate boxes though with Red Rose and Wildlife are still available as far as I know. Um, ah. I, that's what they that's what they're still showing them on the website. So those are those are are available it's the com- combination with wings from europe that is not so, i see okay so so okay. you pr- so you provided a lot of the stuff for for the for the the boxes well i wouldn't say that much stuff but uh, some footage that we had dressing room footage and stuff and some live pictures and what have you we we just gave that to them and uh, then i did a couple of huge interviews with uh, the writer in each one of the books for Red Rose and uh, Wildlife. Mm-hmm. Um, the David Frick interview was wonderful. I mean, that was yeah, that was really gorgeous. Uh, that was really beautiful. He did. A I haven't had chance to read that yet. I just went through the the CDs to hear the remastering, and then the DVDs to especially to see Bruce McMouse again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we've never seen it. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm glad they. I'm glad they left. Uh, there was a when we were filming that they had me standing on a stage and speaking into my hand as though an imaginary mouse was standing on it, and this big long conversation. And I had no idea about acting, especially in that kind of a situation. <laughs> it was probably one of the most uncomfortable things I'd ever done. I'm glad they left it out of the film. <laughs> Oh, they left it out. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah that made the cutting room floor. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought the I thought the the Bruce McMouse thing was was wonderful, and I yeah, was it was it was great. And I was reading through the book, and it said the reason he didn't release it was because it was like Disney, which is really kind of a you know that's a high standard to to go after. But I mean, the film itself was great, and what was really nice. Was the fact that you guys did most of, uh, most of that live um, or most of that music live, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was really cool too. I mean, it was beautiful, and the Blu-ray looks tremendous. I mean, I was. It looks so clean and sharp, and yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. It, it, it re- I don't remember what show that came from, or whether we had filmed that especially for the Bruce McMouse show. I, I, I couldn't tell from the background what the deal was. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure uh, Beatle enthusiasts, you know, the Wings enthusiasts will let me know <laughs> shortly. <laughs> so when when Paul start, started Wings, um, he said it was like starting back from scratch, which it, it, which it really was. What was that like for you to work with someone like him at that point in his career and yours? Well, it was uh, it was jumping off the deep end, you know, because I was a successful uh, session guy in New York, and I was making good coin, and <laughs> uh, and I was uh, getting a little bored with running from. No, I shouldn't say bored, but. It was uh, getting harder to run from session to session and n- not knowing what what was going to be required of you going from session to session. Sometimes the music wasn't really great, but uh, that's your job to go and make it great. And here's an opportunity to play with uh, the best-known musician on the planet. And I had such a great working experience with Paul during the Ram album 
that I thought it was going to be an extension of that and uh, that we were going to be, uh, in his terms, a shit hot band, you know, and uh, really get out there and leave a mark in history. And it was really different to uh, get to Scotland and find out that the band was, you know, wasn't going to be what I expected, but I had such faith in Paul that I just went along with it. And uh, we, we turned it into something that I could be very proud of, but it took a little time. What was it like seeing, seeing all those pic- old pictures again? I was looking oh, through... It was, uh, <laughs> I had... I'll tell you, I had tears in my eyes when I was looking at the uh, the books and the DVDs and everything. It was just brought, brought back some really fond memories of a major portion of my life mm-hmm. uh, that that opened the door to uh, a whole new life. But, you know, once you play with a, a guy like Paul McCartney, it's in, ingrained forever in your career and... Uh, even even though it's been 40 years since we worked together, it's still part of my everyday life. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am doing interviews with you, you know. Right, right. Um, so yeah. And uh, even on my even on my new jazz record, Boomerang, which is doing really well, you know, the first record we did five McCartney songs to pay tribute to him and just to gather a little more uh, exposure uh, as a jazz record. And then this record, Boomerang, we did uh, Live and Let Die in our, in our way of doing it, which is a, you know, so I'm all, it's really a, a major portion of my life, those years with Paul and, and Wings and Ram. Let me, uh, since you mentioned Live and Let Die, uh, one of the, uh, um, you know, things in, in, um, uh, in the, uh, wildlife is is all those outtakes of living to let die. Um, yeah, that that surprised me because it said take ten. <laughs> really? I don't ever remember doing ten takes on anything we did as wings. Really? Unless it was a lot of things where they stopped and the, you know there was a mistake and and they just stopped immediately or, or there was a technical issue and they stopped. But I, I we were a quick band. We just went in and nailed it. We got in and out and. Uh, went, went on with it, you know, got on with it. But I, I, when I saw Take 10, I thought, wow, that's really bizarre. Unless, like I said, like they were doing changes to the sound and what have you, or, mm-hmm. or we'd start a take and didn't get it, didn't get it right. But uh, most of those would have been incomplete takes, I'm cert- right, certain right, of that. Right, right. Uh, um, and yeah. I, I don't remember us recording it before we recorded it live with the orchestra at George Martin's. I, I don't recall that, but I'm sure somebody will let me know how that went down. But I, I don't recall that. Really? Uh, because yeah. because it sounds it sounds like you know it sounds bare without that orchestration. You kind of listen to it and you go. You know what is this? I mean, those must have been very, very early takes. Um, must have been. Now maybe, maybe uh, the, I, I haven't had a chance to really research that. Maybe we did that before they brought the orchestra in, just to get the sounds of the uh, of the band correct and everything. That that could have been the case, and then they brought the uh, the orchestra in later, and we we did it live with orchestra the the final take. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, I, 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 I dug it though. I, I thought it was great. I'd like to go back and compare it to, to see if the sounds of the of, of Wings, the band itself, were comparable to the sounds on the final takes with the orchestra. So I'll have to find time to do that in between all these interviews. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You say in, you said in one of the books that um, you didn't know Linda was in the going to be in the band when when she uh, when you joined. At first, it was going to be Hugh McCracken, mm-hmm. and we had talked about a piano player from New York called Paul Harris, mm-hmm. and we, we, I was I was hoping that that would be the band, and then when Hugh showed up in Scotland, he finished a, a Gary Wright tour, and he was, in, he was in Europe, so he came up, he and his wife Holly flew up to Scotland, we all got together up at Paul's place, and so we talked about putting a band together. And uh, at that point, Hugh opted out. 
And for years, neither Paul or myself could figure out why would you opt out from something like that? And some years later, it was actually a few years before Huey passed, we got together in New York and he said, you know why I didn't go along with the idea of joining a band was I had two young kids from a prior marriage and I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't live in Europe and miss their growing up. Mm -hmm. That would have been too much of a, that's why he opted out. So when I told Paul of this, it really, it was heartfelt and, uh, you know, Paul being the father that he is and everything, it really made the whole situation a whole lot sweeter. Oh, that's good. The, he had no idea. He had no idea. Hmm. He, he was so soft-spoken and a man of so... He was a man of so few words that it just left that big question mark for many, many, many years, you know, even though his playing was outrageously wonderful. Um, so I, I was glad that I could clear that up. What what did Linda bring to the band? <laughs> In the beginning, it was tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was it tea and other uh, tea and other stuff, tea or with... tea and other stuff, or just tea? Not, well, tea. Okay, you can work both ways if you know what I mean. Yes, or, come on. Tea. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, but no, uh, obviously, she was scared beyond belief that she was going to take on a role so large, but. You know, Paul taught her the little bits and pieces that she would have to learn, and uh, she was willing to learn it. And her her rock and roll background was what, you know, going to all the Alan Freed shows mm -hmm. in New York and all that. She was really a rock and roll person, and Paul loved that about her and uh, thought that he could teach her what she needed to know. And at first, it was rocky. It was beyond rocky. It was, uh, I mean, singing in tune and, and remembering piano parts. It was a lot to ask of anybody who was a, a novice. And I must say that over, over time, she, she developed and, uh, and, and uh, gave it her best shot. And I, I applaud her for doing so. Did Paul ever talk to you about how he saw Wings uh, against the specter of the Beatles? Mm, no. No. In those days, there was no, there was no talk, any talk at all about uh, comparisons to the Beatles. We didn't play any Beatles material. We didn't know about the Beatle breakup and the uh, intricacies that were were being involved. Mm -hmm. We didn't know any of that stuff. The Beatles was never brought into the Wings orbit. <laughs> okay. Okay. One of the books say that uh, you guys had the first session at Abbey Road Studio Two. Um, that yeah. the what, what do you remember about that? Oh, it was great fun. I mean, we had a short time in Scotland to kind of uh, rehearse some of this material, mm -hmm. and uh, when we went down to Abbey Road Two, that was my first time at Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was just uh, what a thrill setting up in the uh, in the room that the Beatles did most of their their recordings in and hearing the, the first playback and everything and the, we went in and knocked that record out in basically a weekend for the tracks five of the eight tracks almost five of the eight tracks I believe were first takes because we just went in Paul wanted to give an honest look at a, at a new band didn't want a polished version of, of a new band and, uh, you know, we just went in and cut the tracks, and everybody was really up from it being a new band, from just knowing the material uh, roughly from the time in Scotland that we had to put it together, and then being thrown into this situation where you have the best of the best. Um, we wanted to get that, that vibe of, of it being fresh and new. And, and it certainly was. Uh, it was a, a lot of fun. It was a lot of great fun being being in the studio that week. And then for the next couple of weeks, we took um, we did some overdubs and polishing. And but the basic raw tracks of that record were were done over a period of a weekend. We're talking we're talking wildlife here. Yes. Okay. Did 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 the band feel any of the pressure of the Beatles? You said the Beatles weren't brought into the 
Wings orbit at all? Did the band didn't feel any of the pressure of the breakup that that. Uh, that I don't think so. I don't think so. I think me personally, mm-hmm. I felt like I had to do the kind of a job that Ringo would do on this music. And from the time I first met Paul, I just channeled Ringo, knowing that the relationship between Paul and Ringo was was just so incredible that I would I would think to myself. Well, what would Ringo play here? And then I would play it my way. But even the audition when I first met Paul, first thing I did was go to the Tom Toms and do do some channeled Ringo and did some Ringo licks and stuff, you know. And I think that's what may have gotten me the job. But but how do you uh, not accept something that was that uh, magical and and that historical? the style of drumming that goes along with that music. So. Mm-hmm. The Wildlife book mentions the um, the run-up to the ball where you guys had that public, um, or, or the, right. the first, and it, it mentions that uh, Paul made a joke about Monique um, that didn't go over very well with you. What do you think about that now, or do you think about it at all? I, I think you're referring to the the back cover of the wildlife album right about Moni Moni yes. the, dr- the drinker yeah yes we did not appreciate that my wife is damn near a teetotaler I mean she doesn't drink like out of the blue and we did make us think about that and at the time they had us uh, sign a document uh, that we were okay with it and we were kind of pressured into that, and we, we were never comfortable with that. And to this day, Monique will get, uh, people will come up to her at a Beatle Fest or whatever and say, what was that all about? You know, and it's, it's just something that wasn't necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, long, how long have you guys been married now? 52 years. C- congrats- <laughs> congratulations. congratulations. As of November 26th, yep. You talked about the Bruce McMouth special. Um, what about the James Paul McCartney special? Um, well, that was a, that was a trip. I mean, that was really uh, we worked very hard on that. Uh, you can see some of that stuff was done live in the in the uh, the studio out there. The, the car used to pick us up every morning and drive us out to the studio, and we work, 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 and um, it was great fun. We had great, you know, Gary Smith and Dwight Hemian and. Uh, uh, the band didn't really have much to do. I mean, Paul and, and the uh, producers got together and and worked out all these ideas. We would just show up and do our part, you know. <laughs> and uh, a lot of it was great fun. A lot of it was tedious. Whenever you're filming, it's, it becomes tedious. But it was, uh, for the most part, we were really proud of it. What was it? What was it like at the early gigs when you guys did the first gigs at the col- at the colleges and just showed up out of the blue? What was the? Oh, that was great. That was great fun. Was it? I, I'll never forget. Paul said, "Yeah, come on up to the house tomorrow, and we're going to go on tour." I'm like what? <laughs> so uh, you know, I throw a couple of t-shirts, a couple of jeans in a bag, and uh, and head up to the house. Now we get up to the house, and there's a. There was a truck, like an equipment box truck, and a, a twelve-passenger van in front of the house, and and Paul says, "Well, where's Monique?" And I said, "Well, she's at home. She's not coming along." He says, "Oh, yes, she is." And so he picks up the phone and he calls Monique, and he says, "Pack a bag and get up here as soon as you can." And uh, so it was the wives, the kids, the dogs, and uh, Paul driving most of the time, and we we just set out and. We'd find a place to play, uh, go to a university, ask if we could put on a show that night, and they'd say, well, I don't know, the kids are having finals, and then they'd, Ian and Trevor, our roadies, our two roadies, uh, that would drag the kid from the student union or something out to uh, the van and say, I got Paul McCartney out here, and Paul would wave to him, and they said, oh yeah, you can play tonight. <laughs> The guys would set up the gear, and we'd go uh, look for some kind of a dumpy hotel to stay in that night. And it was great fun. I mean, there was uh, sometimes the room wasn't big enough that we we stayed in these these really funny little British hotels that uh, you know we were all sitting on the bed in, in a room playing guitars and hanging out after the show. 
we'd have to leave the door open because if you close the door, we all couldn't get in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'll never forget, we were uh, up north one night, and uh, this night manager, this little bald fella came up to us. I think his name was Cyril. And he had a little kid's pail, like a sand pail. Mm -hmm. And he said, does one of you people own that black and white dog? Paul goes, yeah, that's my dog, Lucky. He says, why? He says, well, he's running around the hallways and he's shat in the hall. You're, you're going to have to clean this up. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul went and cleaned up. You know, it was magical. We we had great fun doing that. We'd, we'd stop at fish and chip shops and have lunch. And uh, it was really, uh, it was down home. Just talking about uh, fish and chip shops. What happened, uh, shops, what happened when you stopped at, at a shop you know, with Paul McCartney and all of a sudden, you know, and people are going, whoa, what What was the reaction? We were so incognito and uh, there was never a hassle with fans. Really? Never. Wow. Yeah, well, they, they did, that's, you know what, I really think, <laughs> I really think, well, at one of those places that we stayed, Paul had a little beef with the, it was a bed and breakfast maybe or something like that, he mm -hmm. had a little beef with the, with the uh, the owner of the place over something, and um, somehow or another, his elbow kind of uh, hit the guy in the face. <laughs> Ooh, wow! I don't think he did it intentionally, but all of a sudden, <coughs> Heather's <clears throat> the oldest girl is running around saying, "Everybody, get up, pack up, we got to get out of here. The cops are coming." And <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah, there was no big deal about it. Uh, but I, I really think that that's where he got the term "band on the run" from. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is mentioned in one of the books, and yeah, that's that's an interesting story. Are you going to go see him when he uh, comes through uh, next year? If he sends me a ticket, I wouldn't pay. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The well, last time he was at Dodger Stadium, uh, he uh, he called us up and invited us down. He usually invites us when he's around town. And a couple of months ago, when he was here in L.A. finishing up his record, uh, Egypt Station, he, he he gave us a ring, and uh, we went down to uh, the studio and spent a couple hours with him. He played us a couple of the new tracks before they were finished. And, you know, we're great friends today. And he's a busy guy, and he's managing an empire and all that. So, you know, I, I try not to bug him. But I, I think I'm probably the only guy from the past that can reach him and, you know, I got his cell and his home phone and all of that. Linda hooked us up with the home phone many years ago, and, and we worked out our differences, and we stayed in touch and became good friends. And we've seen him a lot over over the the, the last ten years, you know. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. And we and we stay in touch and talk. Talking about uh, Boomerang, what's the what's the um situation with the with the group uh you guys are going to be making another record or i believe it's a three record deal and the record company is very happy with this for a jazz record right out of the gate i mean it's selling very well in europe <clears throat> and it's out in both lp and cd and i believe the lp sales are doing quite well in the u.s too uh thank god for that you know because cd is on its way out mm -hmm. <clears throat> But uh, hopefully we're going to uh, we're we're talking to management and an agent now as we speak, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to put together something where we can get out and do like a a national jazz club tour, uh, and maybe go to Europe and do some festivals and what have you. But I, I'm thrilled that uh, this trio is just so I hate to use that word again but it's it's very magical when we first got together uh, something special happened when when the three of us played together there was a an esp uh communication that didn't didn't exist with anybody else i've ever worked with and so i just said well, let's get together and um, come on up to the house and we'll start recording an album in my little home studio and our first record came out in 2011 or 12. It's called Reckless Abandon. Mm -hmm. And that was that was done in my house here uh, with very little equipment and everything. I'm still very proud of that record. There's a lot of great playing on it. And we that's the one where we actually did five McCartney songs, which was my guitar player, John Cudini's idea. He said, you're best known for the, this stuff. Why don't we just take some of those McCartney songs? They're great songs. 
and revamp them for a, a jazz trio. And we did, you know. And then when this record came along, uh, a man named Bruce Quarto, who runs uh, his label is QVR, Quarto Valley Records. Mm -hmm. uh, he signed us to the contract, and uh, <clears throat> it just came out of the blue. It was, it, it was kind of one of those things that was supposed to happen. And uh, this time I had a, a small but budget that I could go into the one of the better studios in town to record the tracks. And then fortunately, my old friend Al Schmidt took on the project and mixed it uh, at Capitol Studios, which really, uh, uh, that's the best of both worlds right there, getting Al and Capitol. Right. So uh, we're really proud of this record. As soon as it was done, I sent sent Paul a copy of, uh, he wanted to hear our version of Live and Let Die. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I sent that over to him, and he just thought it was great. And he said, what a cool version, uh, a nice way to treat the song. And uh, we got in just about every element of the song except the reggae bit and the ballad bit. But all the George Martin's uh, crazy stuff that he wrote in the, uh, in the head. Now, it, it turned out really great. We're really proud of that. It was a lot of fun recording it, too. It was kind of my idea, the arrangement. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one that I took a little more uh, of a role in, in arranging the tune. Welcome back to the show. On this day in history, on December 27th, 1963, music critics from the newspaper The London Times named John Lennon and Paul McCartney as the outstanding composers of 1963. Two days later, the London Sunday Times music critic Richard Buckle proclaimed Lennon and McCartney, quote, the greatest composers since Beethoven. December 27, 1980, John and Yoko's Double Fantasy album started an eight-week run at the number one spot on the U.S. album chart. December 27, 1981, American composer, pianist, singer, actor, and band leader Hoagy Carmichael died at age 82. Carmichael was the composer of Georgia On My Mind and also composed two songs covered by George Harrison, Baltimore Oriole, and Hong Kong Blues. December 27, 2008, Delaney Bramlett, one half of Delaney and Bonnie, who had worked with George Harrison and Eric Clapton, among others, uh, passed away. December 27, 2015, Stevie Wright, the lead singer of the Easy Beats, who had a big hit with Friday on My Mind, also passed away. December 28, 1968, the Beatles went to number one on the U.S. album chart with the White Album. December 28, 1971, George Harrison was at number one on the U.S. singles chart with My Sweet Lord and became the first solo Beatle to hit number one on the U.S. singles chart. December 29, 1966, Paul McCartney began work on a new song named Penny Lane. Happy birthday on December 27th. Born in 1931 was Elvis guitarist Scotty Moore. And born in 1941 were Les McGuire of Jerry and the Pacemakers and Mike Pinder of the Moody Blues. Uh, happy birthday on December 28th to Edgar Winner, born in 1946 and a former member of Ringo Starr's All-Star Band. Happy birthday on December 29th to Ray Thomas of the Moody Blues, born in 1941, Rick Danko of the band, born in 1942, and Marianne Faithful, born in 1946. That's all for this week. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com or separately on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join our Beatle News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in Beatle news. And check out our That's What I Want Beatle Store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or your favorite people. Look for our next show and please subscribe. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you!
keep that one. Market fab.